Okay, so today um, we're going to look at basically an overview of the First Testament or the Old Testament. But I thought first I'd give a quick look at the Bible. What is the Bible? And then look at what is the First Testament, what is the Old Testament. So if we ask that question, what is the Bible? Well, we could say it was a bestseller. And we know that. But I wonder, is it the best read book? Because often it sits maybe on library shelves or in drawers in motels or in shelves in homes and we don't really look at it. And then when we do, do we really understand the Bible? It's, it's a big text, it's a complex text. And I think we need to come to it with somewhat of an informed understanding. It's an important text because it's the basis of our Western society. Our laws do come from the Hebrew text, from the laws of the First Testament. If you go into any art gallery, you will see lots and lots of biblical paintings. Lots. I had a, um, a friend, an art teacher who was overseas doing a tour of art galleries. She said, if I see another painting of Judas with Holofernes' head in her hand, <laughs> I will scream. So biblical art is everywhere. And music, music, I mean, comes to mind um, Nabucco, the opera, Verdi's opera, um, about the exile, the Babylonian exile. Salome about the beheading of John the Baptist. Oh, well, Handel's Messiah, um, the lovely masses we have by Bach, using the words of the scriptures. And literature, I mean, people from Shakespeare to Milton to John Donne to T.S. Eliot to D.H. Lawrence, Patrick White, Judith Wright, all use biblical imagery. Liturgy, our prayer, certainly involves the Bible. Theology, in fact, they say the Bible is the soul of theology. Our holidays, Christmas, Easter, our lifestyle, our faith. So it's probably more in our lives than we think, this biblical text. Just some basic things about the Bible. What's in the Bible? Well, simply two testaments, Old Testament and New Testament. It's broken up into two sections. If you look at my Bible, you will see that's the start of Matthew's Gospel. That's the beginning of the New Testament. And this is all Old Testament. It's quite large, isn't it? <laughs> it's a really big section. This is not quite as large. This, of course, the First Testament, was Jesus' Bible. He didn't have the New Testament. It wasn't written. So this was where Jesus got his thinking, his ideas, his spirituality, his prayer from. So as I like to say to my students, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's probably good enough for us to really work on, to look at, to love, to treasure. You'll sometimes hear it called uh, Hebrew, <laughs> Hebrew scriptures, Christian scriptures. And I suppose it's a less religiously chauvinistic way of saying Old Testament, New Testament, all can sound old, obsolete, no good. New Testament can sound better, wonderful, shiny, new. But of course they're both the same. My, my lovely GP who's Indian and, well, not a practicing he Hindu, but was certainly brought up as a Hindu, he said, can I ask you a silly question? And I said, sure. No question's really silly, I don't think. But he said, what's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? And which one is the more important? So, of course, I told him <laughs> the difference. And I told him also that they're of equal value. Neither is more important than the other. They're both the Word of God. So, Hebrew Scriptures, um, because they are the texts of the Hebrew people, Christian Scriptures, because they're our texts and they're certainly not in the Hebrew version of the Old Testament. 
First Testament and Second Testament. They can also be, the Bible can also be referred to in that way. And there's a lot of discussion about names and should we change them and whatever we change them to, we're going to offend someone, you know, even First Testament, Second Testament. Christians might take offence at. <laughs> so what do we do? Well, I think we try and be sensitive. Use whatever names we feel at home with. But remember that they're both important. And the First Testament, the Old Testament, has a right to stand on its own. It doesn't need the New Testament. In fact, I think the New Testament probably needs the Old Testament. It wouldn't make sense without the Old Testament. Um, just again, a sort of a map of all the books of the Bible, and you can see there that it's Catholic Orthodox list. Because the Catholic Church and the Orthodox churches uh, have a few extra books in the First Testament that are not in the Hebrew list or are not in the Protestant list. Um, and, and we'll talk about those, the, we'll mention those as we go along. But we have about seven extra books in the Catholic version, Orthodox version. Okay, let's really look at the Hebrew scriptures at this First Testament. Strictly speaking, for the Jews, it's divided into three sections. Usually Christians divided into four. I like the three sections. I think they're fairly clearly marked. So the first section is the Torah, the law. It's the law teaching way of life. And it's those first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We'll come back to those. The second section is the Nervium, the prophets, and it contains what the Jewish people call the former and the later prophets. Um, the former prophets, those texts we would put into our historical category. Uh, Navi in Hebrew is prophet, so Nervium is the plural prophets. And then the third section, the last section in the Hebrew Bible, is the Ketuvim from Katav. Um, he wrote, and it's the writings. Now Jesus refers to the Law and the Prophets in 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 the New Testament. The Ketuvim, the writings, he doesn't probably because they were still fairly fluid and still being um, included in the Hebrew scriptures. The Jewish name for the First Testament, for the Old Testament, is Tanakh. Or Tanakh. You'll see it spelt in different ways because we're transliterating from Hebrew, so you'll always get different spellings. And Tanakh is an acronym, of course, for Torah, Nerviim, and Ketuvim. So if you're in the presence of Jews, they would love you to talk about the Tanakh. <laughs> rather than the Old Testament, because that really gives it its identity in its own right, I think, in their eyes. So the books of the Bible, the First Testament, the Torah or Pentateuch. Now, Pentateuch, funny name. Um, it comes from a Greek word, Pentateuchos, which means book of five volumes. There's a strong Greek influence in the Christian tradition and so we we do use some Greek forms of words and to name some of the books in the First Testament even though they're Jewish texts and they have their own Jewish name. Genesis uh, for example Genesis is called Bereshit. Genesis is a Greek word meaning beginning so obviously we're following the Greek there. The book of Exodus, and of course I mentioned earlier on that we've got these five books in the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Exodus is the, the book of freedom, of delivery from slavery, of Moses. Moses is born at the beginning of the book of Exodus and the people are living in slavery in Egypt. He leads them out of slavery into the desert where they receive the Torah, their covenant with God, 
and it's kind of a formation time almost being in the desert. At the end of Genesis they are fairly happily living in Egypt. They've gone down there in time of famine, famine and Joseph was there as a, as a leader, as an Egyptian leader in fact. And it's interesting that he's an Egyptian leader there and we come into the book of Exodus and Moses ends up being in the Pharaoh's court. It is a fairly strong biblical theme that a, a Jewish male figure survives quite well in a foreign court. The book of Leviticus is mainly rules and regulations. Um, it's for the priests, a guide for the priests about what, we, what you can eat, uh, where you can live, how you should live, and that's why it's called Leviticus because the Levites are the priestly tribe, the tribe of Levi. And so Leviticus is their book. Numbers, Numbers again is um, situated in the desert. In fact its Hebrew name is Bar Midbar, in the desert. Because the Hebrews, the Jews will take their name from the first word or words in the text. So Numbers is again exploits in the desert still trying to get into the promised land and then the final book in the Torah is Deuteronomy again a Greek name uh, Deutero second nomos law so it repeats a lot of Exodus and it's like Moses last will and testament to his people where Moses is speaking in the first person. Indeed, God speaks in the first person in Deuteronomy. It's a rather lovely book. Probably written about 7th century BCE. And it has the great prayer of Israel, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. It also has that great statement, um, you don't need to look for the word of God anywhere or need have anyone teach it to you because it's in your heart. In the next section, and, and we're moving into a sort of a more Christian division category of the Bible in looking at the historical texts rather than that law, prophets and writings that I showed you earlier. Joshua and Judges, Ruth, 1 to Samuel, 1 to Kings. Um, the book of Joshua, Joshua took over from Moses and Joshua led them into the land. Moses died before they got into Canaan. Joshua leads them into the land and they conquer everything. Divide the land up amongst the 12 tribes. They renew the covenant. And then the next book, the book of Judges, they have 12 judges to rule over them, various times. They write up the story of these 12 judges, one of whom is a woman, Deborah, which is interesting and unusual. I think it shows that Judaism is probably more supportive of women than we think. <laughs> judges shows us that they're not all settled in the land. They're still fighting with the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites, the Philistines. Things aren't, you know, it's not all their land. So it's, it's a different version almost of the settlement in Canaan. The book of Ruth is there because it's set in the time of the judges, but probably it's written much later. And it's a story about a relationship between two women Often ironically, it's a text that's used in weddings with that lovely statement, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. It's a beautiful statement. But it's Ruth saying that to her mother-in-law. <laughs> and the word Ruth in Hebrew means friendship. So she's a good friend, Ruth. And it is about friendship. She's a foreign woman too, she's a Moabite. So it could really be saying, foreign women are okay. 1 and 2 Samuel 
is um, where we get the monarchy coming in. Because the people are they're, they're losing all their battles, all the other people have a king. They think kings help you to win battles. So they say, OK, we need a king. We need a king. Please give us a king, Lord. Well, because their king is God. Their God is king. And Samuel, who's the last of the judges and perhaps the first of the prophets, he doesn't really want them to have a king. He's right at the beginning. His call is right at the beginning of the first book of Samuel. But eventually, God and Samuel give in and they have a king, Saul. is their first king. And so in, in the books of Samuel and the books of Kings, as the name suggests there, you get uh, the kings of Judah and Israel. You get their stories. And it goes right up to the time of the exile. 1 and 2 Chronicles repeats a lot of kings, but it's written probably later. And it favours David even more than 1 and 2 Samuel do. King David is the sort of golden-haired boy of the, of the Old Testament. The writers and the editors love him. Even though he's not perfect, which is hope for us, isn't it? Even though he's, his family is not perfect, quite a dysfunctional family, really. He's still a golden-haired boy. He's still their great leader. And indeed, on the Israeli star, um, flag today, you have the Magen David, the shield of David. And that six-pointed star is like a shield that was shaped in that, and it would dazzle his enemies in the sunlight, <laughs> is the tradition. That's not in the Bible. But the Chronicler in Chronicles, which is a book we don't look at, two books we don't look at very much, kind of even whitewashes some of David's faults. So it even favours him even more. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah are during the Restoration, after the exile and the people come back from Babylon. And Tobit, Judas, Esther, um, they've got asterisks there, at, I've put an asterisk there at Tobit and Judas because they're two of the books that we have, the extra books, the deuterocanonical or apocryphal texts. Now, they're still Jewish texts, but they're included in the Christian uh, version of the Old Testament. Um, Judas and Esther. Esther also has some apocryphal bits in it too. It has some extra bits based on the Greek translation. 1 and 2 Maccabees the same. They're not included in the Hebrew, although they're great, valiant stories about Hebrew heroes. They're not included in the Hebrew canon of the Old Testament. But we Greeks and Western Christian, Western Catholics have them in. And perhaps last but not least at all is the wisdom text. Some beautiful texts there, and I'll just put the names up. Book of Job, uh, a great text looking at why do good people suffer? Why is there evil? Because Job does suffer, and he has this great dialogue with God. And he kind of doesn't pull any punches. He gets really angry, and he says, I wish I was dead. This is terrible. I hate it. I don't like being like this. I don't like this suffering. Does Job really answer that problem? Probably not, but he certainly looks at it. And he looks at it very bravely. And in the end, he says, I have seen you with my own eyes through my suffering. And I know. So he's learnt through his suffering, he says. The book of Psalms, which we use a lot, great collection of 150 Psalms, divided into five sections, which we might think resembles the Torah, the five books. The Bible does keep having num numeric patterns in it, like 12 tribes and 12 judges, 12 apostles. The Psalms are great prayers, and again, they don't pull any punches. They say to God exactly how they feel. It's a prayer of the people. They're beautiful prayers. They're often prayers of great hope and often prayers of great anguish. 
And they're wonderful to turn to because you can just about find any mood in the Psalms. Proverbs. Um, as the name suggests, is full of Proverbs. Ecclesiastes, again, a wisdom text. Um, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Nothing is new under the sun. It also has that great poem in it. Um, there's a time for everything under heaven. The Song of Songs is a great text too that we don't use very much because it's really a celebration of sexual love. <laughs> Maybe that's why we don't talk about it very much or use it very much. Sometimes it's used at weddings, which is appropriate, yes. But I think we could do with it a bit more and we hardly ever study it. And the Book of Wisdom. Wisdom is one of those extra ones that we have and um, it's not included in the Protestant or Hebrew canon. And Sirach, who goes by a couple of names, Sirach Ecclesiasticus or the wisdom of Jesus Ben Sirach. Um, so a little bit complicated. It's written by a man called Jesus Ben Sirach. It's one of the few books in the Bible that we know exactly who wrote it. And it was translated from the Hebrew into Greek by his grandson. It's all there in the foreword. And it's one of the later books. These particularly, the wisdom books tend to be later. They might have some earlier sections. But Wisdom and Sirach are probably, you know, second century, maybe even first century BCE, that late. The Prophets. Um, and these are what the Hebrew Bible would call the later prophets. So we have Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They're the, we're called the major prophets. Not because they're better, simply because they're longer. And there are 12 minor prophets with wonderful names, I think. Good names if you're looking for a name for your child. <laughs> Poor child. Uh, for some of them, anyway. Some are okay. All right, I'll just put all the names up there. Um, prophets go from pre-exilic times, from the 8th century, right through until about the 4th century post-exilic. Baruch's there, and again, because it's got an asterisk, that's one of those texts that um, Catholic and Orthodox canons have, but the Protestant and the Hebrew doesn't have for the Old Testament. Personally, the book of Daniel, I would not put among the prophets. I think it stands alone as, um, as an apocalyptic text. Apocalyptic texts have strange visions, weird dreams, but they've really got a message saying good will triumph in the end. There's some apocalyptic sections in the prophets too. Well that's a very quick overview, a map of the First Testament. 